In this episode of Colorado Engineers 2015, we hear from professional engineer Johnny Olson, Regional Director with Colorado's Department of Transportation. As incident commander during the historic 2013 floods, he gets personal about what it was like to get Northern Colorado reconnected and the unprecedented efforts of a professional community that came together for our neighbors. Our program also takes a look at the engineering behind the restoration of Denver's iconic historic Union Station redevelopment and the new Union Station Transit Center, replacing the Pecos Bridge over I-70, and how engineers upgraded critical water infrastructure by designing a state-of-the-art water treatment plant in Sterling, Colorado that benefits this rural community and downstream farmers and water users. The city of Sterling in eastern Colorado is home to more than 15,000 residents and is frequently a pass-through for thousands of commuters along I-76. So when the small rural community needed to upgrade its water treatment plant, engineers provided a Sterling solution that brought big city innovations that were affordable to the small community. The city of Sterling faced multiple environmental protection agency violations of the national primary drinking water standard. Its water contained high levels of sulfate and total dissolved solids. The city wanted to install a new reverse osmosis water treatment plant because of its effectiveness in removing contaminants, but the solution would be complicated because the treatment brine would contain uranium. This would be a challenge because of Colorado's strict surface and groundwater quality standards. So the city of Sterling has been operating groundwater wells and disinfection for many, many years. That was all the treatment they had. It was groundwater with disinfection. So for the operators, for the city staff, this was a significant increase in the level of expertise that would be needed, the level of technology, and of course the, the funding for operation and maintenance. And they've done a fantastic job at stepping up to the plate, taking the challenge, and the operators in Sterling, the city staff are doing a fantastic job with this plant. Colorado engineers Hatch, Mott, McDonald solved the challenge with a unique application of reverse osmosis coupled with EPA Class I deep injection wells for waste disposal. This project is both innovative and unique. In using deep injection wells for disposal of the brine, which is the waste stream from an RO treatment plant. It's not the first time it's been done in Colorado. Uh, we're actually the second as a municipality. But it's the first time it's been done to dispose of uranium. So the uranium is naturally occurring in the ground, and we're taking it out of the ground with the groundwater. That's the reason for the water treatment plant. But we're putting it back into the ground with the deep injection wells. We're just putting it deeper into the ground. And that, that's a real benefit um, to getting the uranium and all the other contaminants out of the water cycle. So rather than putting it back into the river or back into the groundwater, we lock it up underground with deep injection wells. And that allows the city to be a good neighbor to the downstream water users. The result enabled the city to meet its water quality goals to provide 14,000 residents with safe, clean, and aesthetically pleasing drinking water, and building a 9.6 million gallon per day water treatment plant without incurring the costs and risks associated with the disposal of uranium contaminated waste. There are a number of things that people wouldn't know about this project, but probably the one thing is the cost effectiveness of having centralized reverse osmosis treatment in the city of Sterling. And I say that because a lot of the residents have been dealing with poor water quality for years. So they've got in-home water softeners, under the sink RO treatment units. And when you centralize that treatment, it takes the costs out of the home and puts it into the water treatment plant. So there's a lot of cost savings from not, you know, going to Home Depot and buying salt or replacing your water softener or replacing the undersink RO unit. So it was surprising to see that when we did a consumer cost impact study, there was a significant savings to the residents of Sterling by using centralized treatment. On a project that's as technically challenging as this one was, doing your, your investigative work, your preliminary design up front and early is very important. And of course, relying on technical experts. Denver's iconic Union Station has been transformed to a local transportation and entertainment hub within the city. The addition of a hotel, restaurants, open and spacious gathering venues, and the addition of a new world-class transportation center has redefined this historic treasure into a gem of the future. 
It's a fascinating look into how engineers embraced challenges, from historic preservation to new development in a tight urban footprint, to bring Union Station back to the future. One thing that people wouldn't know about Denver Union Station is that originally it was all located directly behind Union Station. And one of the things we did early on was a, tickled, a, a reinvestigation of the whole Central Platte Valley. And we've developed a way to spread that out over the 42 acres within Central Platte Valley, which kind of enabled uh, a lot of cost savings overall in the project, as well as increase the opportunity for development to occur in the uh, Central Platte Valley. The Denver Union Station Transit Center Improvements Project transformed 42 acres of blighted former rail yards into the centerpiece of a vibrant downtown Denver, facilitating connections between the region's transit systems, including bus, light rail, and commuter rail. AECOM Technical Services met the challenge to engineer the iconic 8-track commuter rail train hall, new light rail station, and 22-bay underground bus concourse and street alignments, which set the stage for this mixed-use transformation. The historic nature of the area around Union Station and the building itself, probably the biggest impact that was on the transit portion of the project was, you know, the area behind Union Station used to be an old rail yard. So we encountered several environmental issues back there that we have to address during construction, whether it was you know, coal-based filled material, which is the old coal ash that would, the old steam engines would run and they'd just dump it out. And then there were some additional environmental issues that needed to be treated, uh, such as dewatering before it could go out to the, the South Platte River and things like that. On the building, you know, one of the biggest issues is once we got to the point where we were excavating right next to the building. We were basically cutting a 40 foot deep hole five feet from the building. So we had to develop a, uh, a shoring wall that would support the historic station and prevent it from basically tumbling into our excavation. The Transit Center is the largest current multimodal project in the United States, spanning 17 city blocks, and is the largest multimodal project ever to seek LEED certification from the U.S. Green Building Council. The Transit Center sets a new standard for 21st century transit facilities. You know, there's some fun facts we like throwing around. You know, if you were to take the bus terminal, which nobody sees because it's all underground, unless you're taking a bus, if you actually stood it on end, it would be the tallest building in Denver. The amount of concrete we poured into it is enough to fill, pave uh, 10 miles of a three-lane highway one foot thick. The amount of dirt we excavated would fill uh, roughly 20 Pepsi centers. So, I mean, those are just like some fun facts that, you know, you, you just see a project developing that nobody really understands, you know, what all it takes to, to make it happen. The whole transit, multimodal transit hub is gonna have the, the, the biggest impact on, on the, the end users. Basically, it's the new gateway for RTD to all the lines going to the north as well as out to the airport. So everything's gonna come into here. The bus terminal now serves, instead of uh, the old 12-bay bus terminal that was at Market Street, there's now a 22-bay bus terminal that's also underground that just enhances RTD's uh, system for moving people around. Cater, Ruma, and Associates and their design team were faced with the challenge of turning the historic Denver Union Station into a multi-use transit center and hotel. A real challenge that, that I guess uh, required a lot of thought and, and innovation from the team uh, was how to condition the Great Hall. And so that's the old historic train station when you, when you enter Union Station. A lot of uh, historic aspects that we could not touch, could not ch change the historic nature of that space and, and how would we air condition that. Uh, the, th the way we solved that is actually there's a raised floor section in the center of the Great Hall that where their shuffleboard tables are located and that's actually our return air path to air handlers that were located down in the lower level. A unique item that people probably don't know about Union Station is during the demolition phase some of the items that were found uh, that harken back to the glory days. Uh, there was old um, Advertisements for food for 10 cents, coins from the 1800s, old train tickets. So it was just kind of fascinating. I'm not sure what they did with those artifacts, but it was, it was kind of cool.
A more specific challenge for the engineering team was designing environmentally conscious mechanical systems for the newly conceptualized space to offer the ultimate in comfort and safety that were virtually invisible and silent while preserving the historical grandeur of the existing building. For the Union Station project and the mechanical systems, the, the historic nature of the building was, was very important, but there was also uh, an, an eye out for ongoing operational costs, energy costs for this building. And so there was great care and thought into systems uh, from an energy efficiency standpoint uh, for the equipment. We added heat recovery components. We have demand control ventilation for the large occupancy spaces. We incorporated some de-stratification sequences within the mechanical systems because of the high volume spaces to help with energy. Blending high performance components, including thousands of feet of duct, pipe, and mechanical system infrastructure into the overall ambiance of the space achieved the goal, producing a system that was effective enough to qualify for a LEED certification. You know, the importance of mechanical in engineering within the overall project or any project I think it's very important from a thermal comfort standpoint. Uh, you know, mechanical systems, people want to be comfortable uh, within the this, this spaces. This particular space at Union Station, you know, it's, it's not about the mechanical systems for a process, but it is about the people and, and, and people being comfortable and systems operating so there's no noise or vibration that distracts them. So it really is the thermal comfort. Colorado's critical transportation arteries keep commuters traveling safely throughout our cities and state. And when densely traveled bridges need to be replaced, it requires complex engineering solutions that are writing the book on the way projects will be built in the future. Replacing the 1965 bridge over I-70, a dense travel route for more than 130,000 vehicles per day, would challenge Wilson & Company Incorporated engineers and architects to engineer a solution that would improve traffic operations within the interchange while minimizing local community impacts to the neighborhoods and local businesses during construction. Under the direction of the Colorado Department of Transportation, Wilson & Company prepared an interchange alternatives analysis report and accelerated bridge construction decision matrix to determine the best transportation alternative. The solution led to an accelerated bridge construction to replace the aging bridge, reconstruction of the diamond interchange, and incorporating two-lane modern roundabouts at the ramp intersections with Pecos Street. Utilizing a collaborative construction manager, general contractor delivery method, the solutions led to CDOT's most significant accelerated bridge construction and collaborative project delivery in Colorado. Fifteen months after the historic thousand-year precipitation event in northern Colorado that stretched from the Front Range to the Eastern Plains, Colorado's Department of Transportation is still working hard to restore critical transportation infrastructure. The American Council of Engineering Companies of Colorado's president, Peter Monroe, asked CDOT's Johnny Olson, a professional engineer, what it was like to take on the challenge of reconstruction as incident commander. It's a compelling personal perspective about a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The floods washed away roads and bridges in five mountain canyons across several northern Colorado communities. The immediate task that Johnny Spearhead was pretty impressive and his leadership efforts really made all of us in the engineering community proud. We did engineering, but we really had the human side of what we do really affect us in engineering. That's, that's a hard story, that's a hard message and it, and it hurts to see people suffer. And that, as an engineer, that's what you want to do. And we forget sometimes that transportation is about people and it's about the human side and this disaster really brought it home. And when you think about where we went and what this team did from the engineers to the consultant industries, to the local communities, to the state agencies and what we did to bring back our roads, connect communities and lives, was impressive, not just from a leadership standpoint, but from a unified Colorado. I and mean, we all came together to build that state back. And it really starts from with the people. It starts with the people that were uh, affected. It starts with the people that came together to rebuild Colorado. And leadership is just a small part of that. It's really the people that really, really brought it together. 
The essential collaboration between CDOT and Colorado's engineering community was an impressive demonstration of how the public and private sector work together to keep our communities safe. A real team effort where everyone shares the same goal. Uh, it was pretty amazing. The people that uh, during the disaster, when we were in the sort of the uh, rescue phase of the disaster, our folks basically had the responsibility of closures and ensuring that people were safe. Uh, and a lot of our maintenance guys and our engineering folks came together, gals and women came together and started closing down roads and moving uh, construction things. Everybody was calling in on our radios and sending, uh, calling in on the telephone telling us about the devastation and the disaster. And we were sitting in an EOC, an um, uh, emergency operations center. And as you're sitting there and you're listening to the reporting back and listen to the inflections in their voice, uh, you can tell that the disaster was greater than anything we've ever experienced. And as they came in to check in every night and they checked in and you see, I mean, big grown men and, and strong women and men coming in, they, you can see the sense of, oh my God, on their face. This is, and, and, and the sadness that they, because these are their communities. It wasn't just the roadway, but these are the communities these people live in. They were seeing all this disaster. And just having that, when they walk in to see their faces and to see their, their, their dismay of what happened was in talking to them and letting them know what, what our role was, what our mission was at that time, they keep elevating themselves a little bit. And, you know, people get tired over time, but these the men and women of CDOT and the consultant industries and, their, and the communities was pretty amazing to watch them and their energy and rebuild every day to go back out and do what they needed to do. When you drive over these temporary roads and bridges, it's hard to believe that all of it could be done in just three months time. And what people probably don't know, Johnny, is that every aspect of what's been done and what lies ahead will need to be engineered. Early on during the disaster, I realized that we had to start going into the response phase and the recovery phase. How are we going to get people reconnected? Early, it was about safety. It was about closing roads, making sure people were safe on our highways. Well, when we started moving in about the, I think it was about the third day of the disaster, I, got, I brought a team of engineers together and I set them in a room and we sort of started an incident command center in a regional perspective because we didn't know how great it was across the state. We were dealing with three or four different regions, but actually I had the greatest damage in my region. So we started figuring out what do we got to go next? How do we start reconnecting? How do we get to the next phase? And that's when that basically the incident command center in the region started. Well, about September uh, 15th, the governor came out and said, we want all the roads reconnected and open by December 1st. Well, that right away sets the high level vision. So we had to now sit down and start building our mission to that. How do we get there? How do we fold in what we need to do and what we're doing into December 1st? I think early on in, in all of our minds, we're like, December 1st, is that really going to happen? But as a team pulls together from CDOT, consultants, communities, you start building strong individual missions. And I think what we did is we instantly defined, we have to have an incident command center that's a statewide command center. So the executive director, Don Hunt, came to me and asked me to man up the incident command center for the Department of Transportation early in the efforts so we can try to have a one-stop shop. So anybody that needed something, they knew where they had to go. So it's when we build a team, that's when the plan started to come, let's build a team. How do we build a team? What do we need? So the incident command structure came to play. We built an office and we put every potential issue that can happen with, with CDOT employees, with consultants, with uh, state agencies, OEM, Department of Homeland Security, all of us sort of came together under one roof and we started setting the vision for how December 1st was gonna happen. Now that CDOT has reconnected Northern Colorado, there is still a daunting task replacing the temporary infrastructure with more permanent solutions. How do you feel this is gonna be accomplished? Well, the first thing we have to remember is the consultant industry is a, is a partner to the Department of Transportation. We look at them as extension of our staff when we need them. We look to them for innovation. Uh, we look to them for different types of solutions that they have on a broader base. Um, they really, when we are standing in a situation like we were in the flood, they really help staff up our organization. We have a big state. There's a lot of people, we were trying to maintain our normal program. 
You can't really just shut down the state and say, we're not gonna do our normal roadway programs, we're not gonna do our normal maintenance programs. So we had to look to the consultants to help us and give us that, that support. And I will tell you, one of the things that was the most impressive during the incident command structure is the consultants, when they introduced themselves or they were around, they were part of CDOT. They weren't, they weren't just their consulting firms. They were there for the state and part of CDOT and part of that partnership that really had a, had a really positive environment in the, in, the, in, in the office because we had combined CDOT folks and consultants uh, and all the other state agencies. And you would never know which one was a consultant or which one was a state employee. We are both engineers. How did what you basically learned in school and what you've learned since that in the engineering community help you towards managing this critical task? School teaches you how to think. School teaches you the theory behind everything. But when you actually hit the ground um, as a young engineer in transportation, you learn, you learn process, you learn solution-driven decisions, you learn being able to identify different alternatives. I look at it two ways. There's practice of engineering and there's principles of engineering. And there's a lot of practices that we have from years and years and years of experience in transportation and building roads. The principles of engineering brings in the standards, brings in the, the, the engineering, the number crunching, the calculations and the things that we have to do to ensure that we get a product that's gonna be long-term, not short-term. Practice of engineering, we had a number of people with 30 plus years. I bet you, if you tried to add up the years of experience on some of these construction projects, we probably had a thousand years of experience out there rebuilding these roads. And we could not be principles of engineering, we had to use practice. The reason we had to use practice is principle of engineering takes time, it takes development, it takes calculations, it takes a, a lot more effort than just using practice. So when you think temporary on these temporary roads, we had a lot of expertise, we had a lot of strong engineers, we had a lot of strong contractors on the ground that helped us make sure that we were building these roads today that were gonna last, but yet have to come back and do permanent. So these temporary solutions, they're very safe. They are no different than the 1930s to the 1960s, how we built roads. So we are very, we are very confident that what we did is going to last. So when I'm seeing temporary, it's almost like a construction temporary. So here is a temporary situation that you might drive through a construction zone for a couple of years. In some projects, it's even longer, like T-Rex was five years. So when you think about temporary, I'm looking at a construction solution it is no different than a detour or a temporary solution during a construction project. That's what temporary is. We just don't have a lot of construction out there right now. So it's temporary in that sense, but not temporary in a sense that it's not safe. Well, when you think about the mission that he, the governor gave us for December 1st, and then I think later in his speeches, he said, we're gonna build back better. Well, what's that mean? What does better mean? So when we start thinking about better, we can put it back right where it was, right in the same condition it was in, but is that better? What we're doing as a DOT is we're working really close with the Colorado Water Conservation Board and our consultants to find ways to improve the resiliency of that roadway. So analyzing the stream and the roadway together is one way we're doing that. So we, when we analyze, we could put a road in. Transportation's about roads, right? but we actually have to look at this as a system to try to build it back better. So when we build something, when we move it over on bedrock, or we put a armoring system in to protect the slopes, what are those going to be today? We're smarter today than we were in 1976. 1976, they built an excellent system for the technology they had. We're better today with technology. We're better today of thinking, because we've seen it now. Now we know where we gotta go. The state of Colorado, uh, working with the federal government is developing a risk and resiliency program that's never been done in the United States. What we do is we criticality of an infrastructure, threat of the infrastructure, um, redundancy of the infrastructure, and then how long it takes to recover. That can roll into an overall asset management program. It's never been done in the United States. So we're actually, in terms of transportation, we're actually developing that from this disaster. And you'll start seeing uh, more uh, select prioritization, more select um, driving of what projects need to get done and why. So it's a better decision-making tool. It makes us better government. Yeah, you'll tie all the communication from all these other uh, agencies 
and you'll work in transportation as a system with the locals, the state, and you'll bring it all together. And as a citizen and a taxpayer and a, pub, a general public person, you'll see our transportation system being more specific in decision making, more focused and, and being more, instead of data driven, it'll be more performance driven and you'll start seeing improvements along our transportation system. Engineers solve problems, that's what we do. That's what engineers do for a living. That's what engineers want to do because that's the way we think. So as a young engineer, you start learning how to solve solutions, uh, solve problems with right solutions, looking at alternatives. And I think that whole time frame from, from when I started in 1991 to where I actually became the incident commander and the region director, what it did is it taught me the whole gamut of thinking and the whole gamut of how people are important to the process, how important it is for communication. So. When I stepped into that role as incident commander, I had a skill set that I, I learned through engineering, that I learned through growth in engineering and transportation. So engineering is not just number crunching. It's not just budget, uh, scope, and schedule. It is actually about people, and it's actually about understanding a direction. It's actually about working with people and growing in an environment to help you become and make Colorado better, or make anything you do better. That's what we do, that's what engineers are. So that day that you opened the first road and you saw people coming home, how did that make you feel? I was out on 119, it was our first road we opened, and, and people were driving by and waving and, and thanking us. They were, they were connected, they can get through. It wasn't a three hour drive to get back to their homes. They can get in and see their homes. That's in, that's, that's being an engineer is watch people smile and watch people see what you've done for them and the team did for them. It just makes you feel so great. And it's an emotional time because, you know, 30 days doesn't seem like a long time, but people getting back into the homes and seeing their smile and seeing their gratefulness to be getting there, to go back and connect those lives was, was so gratifying and so rewarding. I don't know if I'll ever see anything like that again. I'm Peter Monroe, President of the American Council of Engineering Companies of Colorado. I hope you enjoyed this program and learning about how Colorado's consulting engineers are helping to ensure our communities are safe and connected, and how we're employing sophisticated design solutions to historic renovations, transportation, water, and transit projects that are literally changing the way these types of projects will be engineered in the future. The American Council of Engineering Companies of Colorado is a business organization that has 250 consulting engineering member firms and employs more than 10,000 employees statewide. ACEC is an advocate for its members and assists its members in achieving ethical, professional practices and standards, enabling them to provide quality engineering services to their clients and the public. ACEC offers scholarships to students attending Colorado Colleges of Engineering, and we mentor young students in science and math to nurture future generations of engineers in our state. As master builders, consulting engineers continue their legacy of protecting public health, safety, and welfare, and creating strong, sustainable communities. For more information on ACC Colorado scholarships and intern programs available with our member firms, visit acc-co.org and follow us on Twitter and Facebook and become a part of our conversation. <music>